Hi, Gabby. Thank you for coming on the podcast. How are you doing? I'm all right, Ethan. As I just said, I'm I'm a bit knackered, mate. Um, yeah, do a job. Two days to recover. But other than that, I'm all right, mate. You know, I'm still alive, still under God's sky. You've just mentioned you did a photo shoot the other day for a Scottish singer. Can you tell us more about that, please? Yeah, um, this guy, Callum, I can never pronounce, sorry, Callum, Be- Callum Beadle or Beady. And um, he's a Scottish singer songwriter, but he used one of my images on his album cover. And then they discovered that I was still alive and I could still take pictures. And they asked me to take pictures about two years ago. And, you know, what I find with a lot of musicians, um, doesn't matter how successful they are, they don't like being photographed. And people always find that weird. Oh, well, you're in front of a band. You're up, you're playing in front of thousands of people. Yeah, mate. You can't see anybody because of the lights. And just because you can stand up and sing in front of people doesn't mean you want a camera shoved in your face at, on a Tuesday morning at fucking 10.30. Do you know what I mean? So a lot of these guys, they don't know. When I worked with Plan B, he fucking hated it. I worked with the Bombay Cycle Club. They fucking hated it. Um, so the way I photograph is I, you know, very amiable and I get very quickly and I work very fast. So a lot of these guys invite me back because they find my style of working is not too offensive. You're not standing in a studio all day where a photographer goes, oh, could you stand, could you put me in for four hours? You know, I'm like, boom, 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 boom. But anyway, so he's in Brighton, he's doing another tour. They invited me down to do another session, another, you know, we just wandered around Brighton for a little while. And um, yeah, you know, and I do what I do best when I am can work freely like that. You know, I'm not a great fan of studios. Um, I prefer to get whatever I'm photographing, whether that be fashion or music, and just go for a wander about. Well, we'll get on to all the musicians and uh, fashion brands you've worked with, but I just want to go back to the start. Um, what was life like for you before you bought your first camera? I was a very shy kid. I mean, I was a middle child. I had two very um, extroverted, on the surface, highly intelligent brothers, and I had a lot of um, learning difficulties and learning issues. And um, so I was very much retreated into myself, and I could survive like that throughout primary school and I could basically survive in my own little fantasy world and be kept safe from <clears throat> the outside world. But I turned teenager, I shot up to nearly six foot, even though my essence hadn't changed, I was still very shy, very artistic um, person. I just started to track, attract attention, which um, I couldn't stay in my little bubble anymore. And, uh, you know, I was, grew up in quite a rough estate went to one of the roughest schools in in the whole county so um you know around about the time madness and the skinheads came in i was starting to sort of ease into the ease into my teenage years i was you know that all that chaos was coming to the surface and um around about the same time i got into photography which again was something that i could retreat into because i wanted to be an artist and I wanted to be a comic artist. That was my real passion, you know, like um, the Conan, Frank, Franco, whatever his name is, does all the amazing artwork for the old Conan um, comics. Now, I wanted to do that, but I found it very frustrating because I couldn't probably get my ideas from my brain onto paper. And um, because I was a dreamy, fucking romantic little fucker, I wanted to go to work. There, there was a um, a sale in Christmas about 1978 and they were selling a pair of binoculars and I'd clocked these binoculars and I thought, oh, I'm going to get those and I'm going to look at the moon. <laughs> that was my, you know, so I got the Christmas money, went down between Christmas and New Year's down to Woolworths in High Wycombe and um, next to the binoculars was a little camera, a little Hanimex camera. And it literally is... <laughs> The reason that all this started was I looked at that and I thought, fuck it, I'll get a camera. 
you know, looking back on it, you know, I mean, because it's deeply, deeply subconscious choice. It was like, yeah, I'll get a camera. But, you know, my dad was a little bit into photography, not enough to sort of it being a hobby, but there was a camera in the house and he'd taken photographs when he was younger. Not that that registered at the time. And my eldest brother, who was extremely popular, um, was also taking photographs. And maybe something in my mind thought, well, if I take pictures, maybe I will get some friends. <laughs> I don't know, whatever it was, it was very instant and it was very you know, unconscious. And it was like, I'll get a camera instead. So I took my first set of pictures, waited for them to come back because in those days you posted them off and they came back in the post, opened them up, looked at them and instantly said, I'm going to be a photographer. Just fucking instantly. Not these photographs were anything particular, but I had grown up, you know, being on, you know, being at the bottom of the pile, the working class photography was basically your hobbyists, which were boring old men, and it was just all boring. And then you had the stock Kodak camera with a plastic lens that they sold to us peasants. So every photograph you tended to see of yourself had your head cut off or blurred, they, because they were pieces of shit, these cameras, like shit. And it sort of made me a little bit angry in the past. It's like, you know, just fucking fob the peasants off with this shit. Anyway, so all photography was me was little square pictures with your fucking head cut off. You know? <laughs> but these photographs, what I didn't realise, you know, about the whole destiny thing is this little camera, this little Hanimex, it had a glass lens. And because of that glass lens, these photographs came out crystal fucking clear. That was a bit of a shock. But with that, that combined thing was like, I'm going to be a photographer. And because of my whatever they would diagnose me with now and get me drugged up on if I was a kid. It wasn't back then, my ADA, whatever. I hate these fucking labels, but whatever it was, I just, and I do this and I still do it to this day. If I get into something, I get into it. I get into it. So <laughs> I was like into it, 14 years of age, going through puberty, the world's opening up and I'm right at around that time. I get my camera, I've got some, the whole effort to become an artist and this really upset my art teacher actually because you could see potential in, in me just went out the window mate I could create in I could create with that camera and put my ideas or what I found interesting and make it real instead of frustrating over you know pencil drawings and trying to get things right and then going down to London and seeing some fucker on the street drawing like Rembrandt and charging a fiver for it. Do you know what I mean? You're like, what the hell? I'm never going to be able to do that. And this geezer's, <laughs> this geezer's busking. So the photography just, everything could be pulled into that. And again, that's retrospect. I'm fucking 14, for Christ's sake. I'm not deeply sitting down analysing what I'm doing. I enjoyed it. I liked it. And at the same time, you know, I, I was too young for punk in a way. Um my music taste as a kid was my parents rock and roll albums and classical music and um the film soundtracks and then you know things started bubbling under the surface and I, the, the outer world started to get into my little bubble and i bought the first police album off of a mate of mine up the road played that still wasn't getting really into anything that was modern and out there and then along came um, the two-tone movement and that was it I heard madness. And again, the same as photography changed my life, seeing them on top of the pops changed my life. So again, I threw myself into what madness were, what their influences were, like any fucking kid that falls in love with a, with a band. You know, they become, you know, they become your, you know, your goal is to find out more about them and, and just, you know, consume anything that comes from that. And of course it, it was a zeitgeist that went across the whole country, the two-tone movement. We were a new generation. I mean, the elder brothers hadn't really grown up with the West Indians and the other immigrants, but we were all second generation. I'm second generation Irish. All the people in my year were, were born, you know, the West Indians were born in this country. And that two-tone movement sort of united us for a little while. And that was my thing. That was my... Uh, rites of passage that was my 
you know, 10 years early, it might have been Led Zeppelin, but that was my zeitgeist. So the combination of me um, becoming a teenager and what that entails and all the chemistry just flying around your body at the time, the camera, um, the photography coming in, and then that whole madness, two-tone skinhead thing rising up. And I was very passionate about it. So I just started taking photographs of anything that moved, really. Basically, my mates and shit. So that's how it started, mate. I bet you wish I never asked now, do you? Eh? <laughs> I know you mentioned uh, you were a quiet kid, but did being a skinhead help you express yourself? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, it just... I was missed. Fog. I quite liked it that way. <laughs> but the world wouldn't let me do that. And I was quite bullied because I, because I was so shy. I was like an easy target. And, of course, my nose is still fucking massive. But when I was 14, I sort of, my ears stuck out, my nose was big. They called me Gonzo because I was so sensitive that every time, you know, I was rejected, I'd, it really hurt, you know. And, of course, the school was fucking hardcore, bruv. It was fucking terrifying. And, of course, I'm running around in my first year with, like, terrified most of the time. And then um, this kid called Darren Evans, you know, I remember I was walking to the woodwork block, I think I had my first skinhead, but I wasn't committed. I'd had my hair cut and I still wore corduroy flares and I was still a div. But my brother got into it and he was like, he looked like a 20 year old skinhead straight away because of his sense of fashion. I never really had one. Anyway, this kid pushed past me and get a fucking way, Gonzo. And I remember my, I felt my heart sink the same old feeling as them. It felt like somebody had got ice water and cracked it down my spine. And I just remember, I went, hmm? turned around and went, bang! <laughs> fucking hit him, mate, he went fucking flying. I'm oh like, holy shit. Bullying stopped very quickly after that. Then I shaved my head and then I didn't stop fighting for 10 years. Because obviously all those years when I had my dyslexia and I had all those learning difficulties and I was trying to retreat, I suppose a lot of anger was underneath that. And I didn't realize it until it, sort of came out and pulled down Evans and anyone else that got in my fucking way over the next 10 years. But the skinhead thing totally, all of a sudden I transferred. I walked home one day, 180. And I wonder how my parents, and all of a sudden I was there, very much fucking there with a the shaved head and getting in trouble. I mean, yeah, it was a 180 transformation. It wasn't gradual. It was one yeah, day I was just fucking just like, holy shit, I was six foot, I started training. Turned out I was a good fighter. I don't know why. My family's not particularly violent. Well, my mum's my mum is um, Irish and all that. But, you know, it wasn't something that was a big, something that was something I wanted to avoid at any cost. And then I suppose, you know, once once I started to be able to defend myself, you know, I sort of didn't take much shit after that. And then that, that brings its own issues. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was all a combination, all like a, a, a big fucking, you know, mixture of alchemy of the wave of um, this new two tone thing that's come along, and it was very fresh, it was very new, even though it was taken from the sixties, um, Prince Buster and all that. It was still utterly fresh because a new generation of of, of um, kids. And yeah, it spoke to me, spoke to me so much that I thought that that was going to be my life. You know, I was fucking militant about it. You're going to be a skinhead, you're skinhead for life. <laughs> doing my hair were fucking pathetic. Anybody that grew their hair for a girlfriend, wanker. Anybody that fucking grew their hair for work, wanker. I went into everything as a skinhead. Every interview I did, if you don't want me how I look, mate, you can fuck off. Until I got to 23 and started raving and I thought, fuck this shit. I'm going to go around and hang out with a load of beautiful women and take drugs till the sun comes up. You know what I mean? But before that, you know, I was fucking a skinhead and proud of it. We'll get back to the skinhead stuff soon, but I just want to talk about a bit about the photography. Um, I know you said your dad and your brother did a little bit of it, but do you think it helps being self-taught and doing it your own way? Absolutely. I look back at my work now when I was 15 and there's something else going on there, mate. I don't know what the fuck it is. I picked up a camera within six months. I'm doing stuff a 28-year-old PhD graduate would be proud of. I can't fucking... You've seen them. 
I was 15 years of age when I'd done that shit. You know what I mean? I just got, I'm very fortunate. I found out what I was good at. I was guided for what I was good at. And because of the way my personality is, if I'm interested in something, I will fucking, I will digest it. If I'm not interested in it, mate, it might as well not exist. And so that, a lot of trouble at school with that. But it was a shit school, so, you know, they can't focus on problem kids with learning difficulties. So I just taught myself. Do you know what I mean? I've heard you say it was, it was all there. Oh, what you say, sorry? It was all, it was sort of all the elements were sort of there and I'm unconsciously just going about my life being a pain in the ass and being overexcited about everything and getting into trouble and trying to, you know, balance girlfriends and just all that whole teenage shit. Um, but that was the one consistent thing that, you know, I didn't know how I was going to be a photographer, a professional photographer. I didn't know I was even going to photograph. I just had the mantra of I'm going to be a photographer. And that ma mantra slowly worked its way through to me being involved in the music industry where, you know, that's how I professionally started. Um, but it wasn't, I wasn't sitting around fucking pondering it, bruv. You know what I mean? And I wasn't being pretentious about it. In, in fact, I just, I think I just liked taking the pictures because I never printed them up and showed my mates in. They only ever saw them when the book got published. Yeah. So I think there was something about, because I, I felt so, again, all retrospect, because I, I get asked so much about, you know, the process and, and how I ended up where I ended up. But I think a, a lot of it was to do with, as I've said before, is I didn't feel that I was existed or I was visible. And I think a lot of that was like, I've got to prove I was here. That was an element of it. Yeah, I take these photographs, then I was there. I was here at this time, and also I was so it's like this is amazing. This music's amazing, you know. And I watch my parents watching Coronation Street and just think, oh, Don't you realize there's this incredible world out there? You know, being a teenager, you know, oh, ain't it great? Everything's great, and I'm very enthusiastic and I'm very overexcitable. And, um, you know, as time went on and then the whole demonization came in from the press and the whole fucking, you know, pushing the four Nazis that lived in London as if like every single person in the whole country that liked madness was some sort of Nazi. You know, that divide and conquer bullshit still going on to this day. The working class are an easy fucking target. Um, before that stuff came in, you know, I just thought it was it just needed recording. And then I got older and thought, nah, I was just... I was just overexcited, just a bunch of fucking chaps, really. No one, I wasn't doing anything special. We weren't special. And then the book gets published. And then 30 years after the book's published, it's still going strong. Then I, then I thought, yeah, maybe I was photographing something special. Yeah. But mainstream society didn't think so. They fucking do now. And I always instinctively felt that there was something special. And my brother was something special. And us at that time, we were kings. We were fucking beautiful and we were stars and i recorded that thank god my mates weren't a bunch of fat ugly fucks <laughs> you know what i mean because they do look like you know that, that i get people even to this day coming up to me and saying oh well you know um how did you style that i didn't phone up a modeling agency at 15 and go oh, yeah could you send them <laughs> a model and a stylist but they can't get their heads around that i did that and we looked like that and we weren't actors or models or whatever so I always look for my whole body of that 80s skinhead punk, well, I can't, the 80s stuff. It's more like movie stills. Yeah, yeah. Than it is just p photography because they're my mates. You know, as soon as I, I didn't turn up a 28 year old with a camera, we'd have just been like that, posing and, you know, they'd have all been just posed. But because, you know, they were my friends and my brother and my family, so, you know, that's the mother of my child, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, so nobody in those photographs, very, very rarely is there anybody that I don't know in them that isn't a close friend or was a close friend or a family member or, you know. And another thing people would say, oh, weren't you brave photographing the skinheads? Well, no, not at all. I was a coward. I wouldn't, photography-wise, I, I, I was happy and safe within my crew and within my bubble and that's why I was happy photographing. 
I wouldn't have been happy going up to Oxford and hanging out with people or going down to East London and, you know, because I was a skinhead. It wasn't important to me. What was important to me was, you know, recording moments that I, that I felt instinctively would, I needed recording. And that film would go in a box and I'd process them and no one would see them. And then years later, somebody wanted, found some of them in a library, asked if I had any more. The rest is history. I thought it's I had the, 50, it's I thought it 50 book pictures. Came about. What's that? Is that how the Skins book came about through that? Yeah. Again, it's, you know, I do, I've never done anything for my career except take the pictures. I've never knocked on doors. I've never shown portfolios. I've, I worked in a photo library, so I print pictures up and I put them in the library. It's like Indiana Jones in the, um, at the end when they're taking the ark into that big warehouse. You know, do you remember that scene? They've they've got the ark and they've taken it. There's this massive warehouse that disappears. That's what Camera Press was like. This agency, and I would print some pictures up and I'd put them in a, the youth culture box, and. Oh, it's a long story. <laughs> Let's see if I can shorten it. So I worked at this firm called Camera Press. I kept a relationship with that. So every time, you know, every now and again, I'd sell a picture in Zimbabwe or something like that, or some skinhead or some news thing. It was a news agency, basically, you know, a photographic news agency. And I'd put photographs in there. And I'd continue on in my life. I became an actor at 20, started doing television work. Um, you know, and by the time I was 20, 21, I'd done it. Mate, I'd done front covers of magazines and, you know, I was sort of fading out of it a little bit. I'd been raving. I'd done all the skinhead things. Um, and I got into, you know, a form of psychology union thera therapy, you know, because I was fucked up angry all the time i wanted to find out about it so the more i found out about it the more, the more i found out about my own energy and how you know and why the way i was some of the way i was i sort of got into that and i wanted to do you know my whole life was about my fucking ego am i going to get published am i going to get a photographic job am i going to get an acting job so i just sat around going bald and gray stressing about this shit that didn't matter and then i woke up one day and said fuck this fuck it I'm going to become a therapist. Fuck this shit. I'm going, to, you know, I'm going to give the world something decent and help people instead of just, you know, focus on my own ego all the time. It's killing me. And two days after I decided, really, really firmly decided that I was going to go on this other path because the rest of it just brought me grief because I'm, my emotional content isn't set up for rejection, isn't set up for running a business, isn't set up to be a freelance, like most freelancers, they're all fucked. And um, when it comes down to the artistic side of things, you know, people tend to get into it, they shouldn't be running their own fucking lives whatsoever, <laughs> should become a plumber. Anyway, what was I talking about? I went off on a tangent. Um, the book, I think, how it got discovered. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah, right. So anyway, there's this box with my photographs in, two days after I'd um, decided to knock it on the head and had that release, get a phone call. Oh, hi. Oh, is that Kevin Watson? Yeah. Oh, it's Ma Mary Pomp, da -da 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 -da. some three barrel name. I work for a, a guy called Roger Barton and we are doing a, a, an exhibition and a book on youth culture. And we found 50 pictures from Camera Press and 25 of them are yours. Have you got any more? I went, yeah. Now, considering if that had happened three days earlier, I'd have started to go into a fucking whole panic about, oh, yeah, oh, 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 this could lead to this. Oh, I better go. Oh, my God. I was like, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, could you show us some more? And I went, nah. Dead silence. Oh, oh really? I went, no. I said, I'm not doing it anymore. Um, thanks for giving me a ring, but um, you'll have to find your images. Use the ones you found. Two days later, uh, the main dude phoned me up. <laughs> Look, uh, we'd really, you know, if you've got anything you could show us, anything hanging around, if you could come down to the Royal Horse Hospital and show us. I went, yeah, all right, all right, I'll come down tomorrow. Now, as I said before, I'd have spent two nights, all my photographs, trying 
the insanity of trying to make decisions of what other people like. I'd have been making decisions for a stranger, looking at pictures going, oh no, I'm not doing that one. And because they're all so personal, it's not, they're not just, I'm not just looking at the quality and of, of the picture. It's what they mean to me as well. I'm like, that, that's all tied up with it. So I'd have been sat there going bolder, going grayer, knocking a few years of my life, stressing about strangers of what they like. I think, can you see those? No, there's a grey um, box up there. Do you see those grey boxes? Yeah, yeah. Right. Add one of those grey boxes. Just went through all my... I didn't even look at them, mate. I just picked them up like that, threw them in the box, went down there. This would have never have happened. Thank God I made that decision because I'd, I'd taken away all the emotional stress by making that decision. So I didn't care anymore. I didn't care what people fucking thought of my work. I can run into gang fights... I can go on television and, you know, have millions of people watching me on the bill, but I can't take my photographs in and show them to people. You work it out. I mean, just the lack of confidence is, was, you know, tangible. Anyway, so I got a walk in there and it's, a, it's an old horse hospital. So it's cobbled inside, you know, they've got a, a ramp that goes up. It's in Russell Square. They've got a ramp that go up. And it's all cobblestones. And I went up this ramp, this great big old Victorian building. And um, Roger's there, big table. He actually came, he started his career with Vivian Westwood down in King's Road. And I walked up, up through the box. <laughs> I was such an arrogant cunt. I threw the box on the table. I read, where's, where's your kitchen, mate? I want to make a coffee. And it's, it's in there, so I'm making a coffee. I walked out, and I'll never forget, he's got all the photographs spread out like this. No shitty ones, they're not nothing, you know, just stuff I've printed off, stuff since I've printed off at school. And then he looked there, <laughs> had my coffee, and he looked up and went, do you know what you got here, Gavin? He went, yeah, the pictures of my mates. He said, I think you got a bit more than that, mate. And that's when it all started. And then he... There was a massive exhibition going on down the Victorian Albert Museum. And he told me about that, a youth culture exhibition. I thought, oh, I might as well go down there. I'm out for the day. Jumped on the tube, went down there. And this girl, again, they get these upper middle class girls to do all the receptions to shit. I don't know why. They're all public school. I walked in in my box and, you know, fucking <laughs> however I looked back then. And... Um, I said, yeah, I heard you're doing a youth culture exhibition. Um, I think I've got some shit you might want to see. Oh, no, 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 sorry. It's all closed now. It's abs we, we have no room anymore for any more pictures. I went, yeah, but I think your man will want to see this guy called Ted Polimus, very famous anthropologist. Anyway, this guy came out looking like Andy Warhol. I swear to God, he was an American as well. Big, And he just went to say something. I said, and she goes, oh, there's a guy here. Um, he said he's got some pictures to look at. And he sort of picked the box up and minced off up the hall. Came back and went, right, put the exhibition on hold. We're putting this, this, this. And I ended up having these massive pictures up in the Victorian Albert Museum, bro. Fucking, he just put the whole thing on hold. So it was obviously a good day. Uh, <laughs> you know, the fucking planets were aligned. And I don't care anymore. So I'd walk into the Victorian Albert Museum and fucking demand this cunt see my pictures. That was a good day. <laughs> but anyway, my, because I was a skinhead, we're getting there. We're getting there. I'm we're getting there. I told you it was a long story. So a friend of mine, George Marshall, had, had ST Skinhead Times Publishing. He had bought the rights to Skinhead, which was a, a very famous 60s series of books. He'd done Skinhead, then they'd been bikers, written by a Pulp Friction author. He bought the rights to those. He had a newspaper, um, annual newspaper, thought four times a year, Skinhead Times. Made, you know, just There was only a few of us left dotted around Europe and in England. It, you know, I mean, it was fucking dead as a door now, <laughs> except for us, except for a lot of sad diehards. I wasn't a Skinhead by then, you know, I was... Yeah, you know, I wasn't. I just wasn't. I was twenty-eight. I wasn't a skinhead. But anyway, you know, I I knew George, and I just phoned George up, and I went, George, you know, do, do you fancy doing a photo book? When you, I've been thinking about that. 
Yeah, why don't? Why not? I go, yeah, I'll see what I got. Anyway, in my head, I thought I'd have maximum. This is getting fucking incredible. I thought I'd have maximum 50 pictures, right? And you know, I said that I'd kept in contact with Cameron Press, the library, I kept, because I was a darkroom assistant. I kept in head, touch with the head darkroom guy, Cass. We became very good friends. One of the best photographic printers in the world, bar none. And I'll go down there and I'll say, look, there's a possibility of book. They've got in this exhibition. They want to see if I've got any more pictures. Is it all right if I come and use the darkroom? I said, I've probably got about 50. I'll do the contacts first. So I've done all the contacts up. And started marking them off. Then start printing them. 50, 100, 150, 250, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. <laughs> I remember, I just remember just somebody else, what the fuck was I doing? No one paid me to do this. I don't, and yeah, I know I could do another two or three books, mate, with different pictures of this fucking mental. So I do believe, you know, I'm a great believer that, you know, I was a tool. I am a definite tool. But I was, <laughs> I was at that, you know, it, there was more to it than just my did conscious choices. Because I ended up with this unique archive that no one else in the world has got, which is, again, which is a terrifying thing to have done unconsciously. You know, it's literally, you can't find what I've done. It doesn't exist. That book, though, inspired the film This Is England. Can you remember? Did uh, yes, it inspired a couple of movies. It inspired Gummo as well out in America. Um, yeah, it's yeah, but I just like I'm like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you... This is England. I was living in Brighton, going through the worst time of my fucking life, and I get this phone call going, "Dad, have you seen This Is England?" And I'm like, "Where? Well, no." Funny enough, Shane Meadows had contacted me a good six months before because they were going to do a use a load of pictures in the front of their and in the beginning of the film. But then he decided not to because I can understand that because it would, you know, there'd be the connection there with me. Anyway, I get a phone call when the film's out. Gav, your book's just been made into a movie. And I'm not like, oh, yeah, right, yeah, I've heard that before. Gav, another phone call. Gav, your book's been made into a movie, mate. And I'm like, yeah, fine. And I watched it, I'm like, holy fuck. Holy Fuck. And then Shane contacted me and I helped promote the movie and he was very generous in, in saying how much the book had had influenced the, the film. He had to, basically, did he? He had to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your fault. But, but yeah, he told me he gave the book to all the actors. Um, the older guy, you know, um, yeah, brilliant actor. That that was totally, he, he totally took the style from... And a bit of the idea of the, the tough guy looking after the vulnerable kid. Yeah. In, there's a picture of this really hard looking skinhead with his arm around my brother. But as I took it, my brother looks like he's got cerebral palsy. I've always hated the picture, but he just took that. He just took it. But to everyone else, it just looks like this guy. And it's all that sparked Shane's imagination, you know, that whole protective thing. The older boy protecting the younger boy. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's influenced to fucking, you know, it's influenced so much, especially in the fashion world. Um, yeah, it's cultural. It's a cultural thing now, you know, and I'm just the idiot that fucking has to be behind it. Your, so, fo your photos show that uh, the skin edge culture was like racially mixed, but the film, uh, but, uh, sorry, skin edge often got like called Nazis and right wing and stuff. And the film kind of goes into that more. What did you think of that? Um, there's a few criticisms. The only criticisms I have when it comes out of realism, that guy was 33, right? We would have never hung out with anybody that was 33. Yet. 25 was old. You know what I mean? And there was, you know, there was a few small group of self-identifying right-wing Nazis, and they were a tiny, tiny minority. The newspapers spunked all over him because it was manna from heaven. Oh, yeah, we got something to demonise. And most of us kids listening to madness are like, doesn't skinheads come from a mix of mods and Jamaicans? Without, you know, so it's all a bit weird. You had this, you had this, you know, the propaganda, the divide and conquer. 
you've got Black and White Unite, you've got the special singing about Three and Nelson Mandela, you've got the Black and White kids coming together, and then, you know, it's like a few years later, it's like, fuck that. Let's get hip hop in, let's get them divided, let's get the whole fucking thing divided. This is dangerous shit, these kids coming together. And the demonization was so, you know, so actually not was, yeah, there's right wing people, there's right wing fucking hippies. You know, every time you think of the hippies, you don't think of Charles Manson, do you? Do you know what I mean? So it wasn't an issue with me. It wasn't part of what I was. And I've had to talk about it all my fucking life. And it literally, it just wasn't an issue. I grew up in an extremely multicultural fucking um, environment. And we just had to all battle it out together to find our place in the world. Like all young men and women have to, you know, but of course the fucking mainstream media is very apt to, you know, sensationalize stuff to demonize whatever. They went on to the football fans. They're going on to gamers at the moment. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's consistent and constant. But they've done a good job. You know what I mean? Because my people now you mentioned skinheads and it's like, oh, it's like, yeah, mate, it's like they were Jamaicans making skinhead records. Why don't you focus on that? You can't. You know what I mean? But yeah, it's really boring. It's just really yeah. boring because it's so it's so engineered. Like anything on the street, the reality on the street is so far from removed from these people in a bubble. Um, it just wasn't my experience. Having tear ups and shit like that, but it was nothing. You know, young men and young men have a go at each other in a tiny little town. You know what I mean? But it's a you know a lot of you know, High Wycombe was one of the biggest immigration towns next to Birmingham, I think, at the time. So we all had to knock it out together because it's a small town. And yeah. You know, it wasn't an issue for me. So, what I love the fact is I've got the photographs to prove it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've done my job. I don't have to go around waving a banner going, or wear a badge going, I'm not racist, which I fucking hate. You want to judge me? Fucking judge me, you cunt. I ain't going to wear a badge going, I'm one of the good ones. Fuck off. (laughs) It's a long time ago. I know your brother were a young skinhead. You've mentioned him and how uh, that picture of the older skinhead influenced the two characters. But do you think um, Thomas Turgus's character in the film, the young kid, was moulded around your brother? Um, I think personally that you got a gang dynamic. You know, when I saw Boys in the Hood, the dynamic was the same, except we just didn't have guns. So I think you're going to get any form of like a, a 10, 11, 12 year old playing a skinhead at that time of that thing. You're going to, there are going to be elements of, of it. Um, so there would have been some sort of influence in it, but my brother's a lot better looking than that geezer. <laughs> you can see similarities between the people in your photos and the people in the film, but there's also like, there's photos in your skins book of a, a building like windows being smashed, a building being torn apart, and there's this there's a scene. Oh God! Um, but I think I think that was sh- I think that's anybody that grows up in a small suburban, um, a small outside town um, around that time when you know there were abandoned buildings and abandoned factories, and it was it was a dynamic that we all shared in, and Shane must have shared in that because that. I remember watching it going, oh, my God, he's got it. I don't know if the pictures would have... I think the pictures would have sparked his own experience. Yeah. But I think kids were going up and down the country, shooting pellet guns, riding choppers, going into abandoned buildings, fucking around on the railway tracks. Generation X, bro. So I think it's universal working class universal British thing that he got hold of, but I think the photographs would have helped him style it. Did, the book, did the book appreciate I reckon it? he did that. He did, him and his mates did that. Yeah. 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 Do you know what I mean? But the photographs would have maybe sparked that, sparked that memory for him. Because a lot of it is biographical, but I think he was a skinhead for a week. Did the book uh, help you appreciate what you'd done in that era? what you've been part of I see mixed Ethan it's mixed depending on how I'm feeling about myself you know really sometimes I love them sometimes I hate them sometimes they're a fucking burden memories are meant to fade for a reason aren't they 
Okay. And I don't have that. Yeah. And it's fucking HD clear as day for the rest of my life. And I think that that's a certain burden. People, you know, memories fade for a reason, for a human reason. Um, I'm sort of vaguely aware of, of what I achieved, but I need other people to tell me that. I'm not going to run around going, yeah, fucking yeah. Because I can't take total ownership. Because it's all so nuts that, even, that it exists. It's nuts that I'm even here to sit and talk about it. You know. And it all came around through other people finding my work. And each of those threads that have led to us talking today are just so delicate. Looking back at one of them, just not getting on the tube that day or not picking up the phone that day or not doing whatever I'd done that day would have led to a totally different path and that that's quite scary. Yeah. You know. Well, after the skinheads uh, came raving, can you remember when that first came uh, took over? Of course I can. Jesus Christ. Again, it's like a defining epoch. It's a, it's a line drawn in the sand. Now the skinheads, we didn't really know what to do with each other. We were facing adulthood. We were facing, you know, we were 23, man. People having kids. The skinhead thing was as dead as a doornail, but we didn't know what else to do. Do So the next thing was just biting the bullet and growing up. And then around the outskirts, bubbling around the outskirts in the 80s with this this rumours of this acid house, which fucking disco music. But I've always been into electronica, and I've always been open to music, you know, eclectic, always. You know, so I... And again, this would happen up and down the country. There'd have been people that had been, you know, yardies and, and, and blues guy, um, the blues party guys, the black dudes, that would have been hardcore into that, and half of their group would have split up to go to rave, same the punks and the skins and any group. Half of them are like, fuck this shit, I'm staying with whatever I'm saying. And the ones that are open minded and became skinheads or became part of a cult because of girls and dancing and joy and, and whatever to be involved in a youth revolution, a youth cultural music based youth cultural movement is about. It's not about fighting, it's not about politics. You don't sit around the pub going, yeah, mate, Boris Johnson, I'm going to dress just like him. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, you know, it's getting closer and closer into us, coming into it. And um, of course, you had those bullshit newspaper stories, ecstasy rappers, and you know, again, they started to, um, the newspapers had no clue what was going on. No one had no clue what was going on. And then one night, a f friends of us that we'd used to hang out with when we were 17, you know, they came from a better part of, they came from out, the outside, outside villages. All these crazy, good-looking dudes with fucking Bentleys and shit, <laughs> car dealers, but really glamorous lot. Now, Gav, what are you doing, mate? You got to come raving, man. We got, you got to come raving. And we're going to Ibiza anyway. Come to Ibiza. And my mate had a week off work in his fucking window cleaning van. We just got his window cleaning van after the pub and drove to fucking Barcelona. Left it in a car park and fucked off to Ibiza for a week. But I'd sort of done these a couple of years before that because I was working for uh, about a year before that because I was working for Limelight um, in the VIP room photographing Z celebrities and these two Z celebrities had a fight and one of them dropped these E's and the bouncer went, quick, take one of those! And I took it and I'm sat in the bar drinking Perrier going, this fucking stuff is amazing. But it was out of context of the rave, see, so I didn't really do it for a year after that. But I'd heard about it from a singer called Stephen Tintin Duffy, who took it in Jamaica, and he said to me, this is going to revolutionise the world. And that was in 1987. Didn't think much of it. And then uh, went to Ibiza, came back and started going to the raves, and I just remember the sun coming up, and with all these, all the, all the whole town came together, all the rich kids, the rich kids phoning us up, asking if, we, asking if we're coming to a rave. Like the rich, the rich girls who wouldn't have even fucking pissed on us if we were on fire. We were the anchor. We were the skinheads. We were the fucking people you avoided. We were the bottom of the barrel. And it was a revolution. I just remember, you know, tears in my eyes, watching the sun come up, going, thank you, God, mate, for fucking letting me be a part of this and being young enough to be a part of this. And um, 
I used to get him free to the raves because you know the whole town knew I was a photographer. And um, I hated it. I hated it. I hated taking pictures. Fucking hated it. I hated taking my camera. I'd take it down there, get off my head, take some pictures, look at them, think, oh my god, they're shit. <laughs> it must be hard to take pictures in a like warehouse, wasn't it? 120 degrees. <laughs> Fucking camera, sweat on the inside, on the inside. <laughs> Literally, I got a picture where it started to develop itself in the camera. <laughs> And not only that, it was a deeply paranoid time, man. Everyone was, you know, it's like I was a fucking big ex skinhead, fucking with an arrogant cunt, because I'd have got into a few fights, I think. But we were the acid skin, so we were basically just the hardcore lot of the skinheads. I bought a camper, and they called us the acid skins. So people got used to me, but I got in for free. And I look at the pictures, and I think, oh, my God, they're terrible. Because they were terrible. Well, no, no. It's taken me a long time to get used to the raving book. So, yeah, and that's how that happened. And that went on for two years. And then I finally did pack up and move back to London and, and start the second round. Well, the next stage of my life, which was trying to be as immature as I can for as long as I could. What about the uh, Raving 89 book? I, um... Again, I'm a bit like Ronnie Corbett. I can't just, you know, it's not a one sentence, one sentence answer, mate. Uh, yeah, everything crumbled when I was in Brighton. If I didn't clean myself up, I was going to be dead anytime soon. I was, you know, doing such stupid shit, doing community service. I just had to clean myself out. My girlfriend left me, which broke my heart. Never, never recovered. Um, and I thought, I've just got to face the music, man. I can't drink anymore, otherwise I can't go, when you split up with somebody, you go on a bender. I've been on a bender for seven years. The sort of bender I'd have to go on <laughs> would be a death bender. So instead I went the opposite, which, so then I, I was just left with all these feelings that I'd suppressed for a very long time, man. Ooh. No wonder people don't fucking give up, give shit up. No wonder I've got great sympathy for people that, yeah, anyway. So I'm going, I'm doing this community service down in Brighton because I've been a cunt and got into trouble with the old bill. Luckily, they didn't knock me up, but I'd done the community service. And at that time, I kept getting this phone call from a magazine called Vice Magazine. Never heard of them. Anyway, they phoned me this really pony shit idea, man, that made me really fucking angry. They phoned me, oh, hi, Gavin, we've been trying to contact you because I'm really quite difficult to get hold of, or I was back then. Because I hadn't done anything for 10 years, you know what I mean? I was doing removals work and signing on. Because oh, good, great to contact you, Gab. Um, uh, yeah, we'd love you to come and do some... Pardon me. Because you know Vice, and this came from Gavin McGuinness, this came from the fucking horse's mouth. When they are in Canada, they had six, was it four or six books? I think they were still at college or they just left or whatever, the entrepreneurs. They had these six books and they said, we are going to make a magazine based on these books and Skins is one of them. Really? Yeah. Jeez. I know. Like so Vice, <clears throat> the original, the oranges of Vice, you know, my, my book was part of that thing that they said, we want to create something that is authentic and in, in I hate the word inclusive, but, but you know, it, it, just relatable. Um, no Ponzi photography, just down to earth, trying to find out what's going on in the world before Disney bought them up and now they're dead. But when they were high, anyway, they said, oh, um, we think it'd be a really good idea if you, um, we, you photograph like people racially abused, but in, in, in Fred Perry's. Why are you calling me up? Why do you think that's a fucking good idea? You can't. That's fucking insulting. Have you seen my work? What the fuck has it got to do with anything fucking racially? I went mental. I very rarely get fucking, you know what I mean? When it comes down to my work, very rarely get fucking militant about it or angry about it. But that was an insult, mate. That was a fucking insult. I said, you go and find a Nazi fucking pictures of you. Fuck. How dare you? Fuck off. And uh, a week later, uh, hi, Gab. Um, 
we got another idea. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you photograph the grime kids from Leytonstone and um, in Fred Perry's? I mean, yeah, that'll do, mate. That's more like it. How dare you fucking ask me to do that shit? And you did that. I mean, that's so. You obviously haven't looked at my fucking work one iota. And um, so I ended up doing that. And um, as soon as I walked through the doors in Vice and done my first session, it was like a renaissance. What I hadn't realised, Ethan, is my book had gone around the fucking world. We well, still do exhibitions around the world now, don't you? Yeah, but the book, I didn't realise. I thought it was a fucking cheap little shitty book made for, you know, the remaining skin. Anyone that was interested in that, maybe Madness fans or people that grew up, I didn't realise. I had no idea when I was doing removals work and, you know, up the pub with my girlfriend every night, that this stuff was out there marinating around the world. And when I'd done a job for Diesel, I met one of the, his head assistants, um, Rini, and we met up for a drink that night when I was out in Italy, and um, she said, Gavin, I've been in every major fashion house office in the world, and said, they've all got your book. No, I'm like, mate, I've been signing. <laughs> no, <laughs> the unit, no, it's all right because I'd have killed myself, man. If I'd have got any form of success before I cleaned myself out, do you know what I mean? So it all works out well. It's frustrating, but it, you can only look back and say, well, that was perfect timing. And also look back and say, I could have got my portfolio and I knocked on doors and, and been pushing and pushing, but nothing, that, what was going to happen was going to happen regardless of getting pissed up the pub and doing removals work or knocking on people's doors and trying to hustle. What happened, happened. That stuff marinated around the world. And when I was back and people realised I wasn't 80, because I took the photographs at 15, well, I was 41 when I started working with Vice. So they were shocked that I was, you know, still relatively youngish. You know, they expected like a 27 year old guy that would now have been maybe you know, heading into his 70s at least. So I was still young enough to be able to, you know, and then you had enough energy to put in. And they said, look, let's publish a book together. Because Andy was a massive fan and he'd always wanted, he just wanted a book with his name on it, you know, of my work. So we'd done, we published Skins and Punks. And that just went incredible, just went fucking stratospheric. So I'm, I'm on this. I'm on this exhibition trip and selling the book and promoting the book and doing tons and tons and tons of interviews. Skinhead, 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 skinhead. So they started saying, what are you doing next? And I, I just always said, I'm doing a rave book. Because I had to say something and I was so pissed off at talking about fucking skinheads. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I just had to say something. So I, there was no rave book. There was no publisher. I just kept saying, yeah, I'm doing a rave book. Yeah, I've got loads of rave pictures because other than that, I was going to become Mr. Fucking Skinhead. Do you know what I mean? I'm just going to become this, this, I'm a photographer and I happened to do this stuff 30 odd years ago. So, you know, I'm like, I'm doing a rave book. <laughs> then my brother sort of mentioned it to a publisher, DJ History. And I went, yeah, we'll do it. So a year later, I had a, the next year I had a rave book published, and I was like, "Oh, thank you." Didn't like it. You know, very nerve wracking because I got these beautiful traditional fucking Cartier Bresson type shots of the skinheads, and they're very evocative, and you know. And then I've got all these blurry, fucked up pictures when I was eating out my head, wandering around trying to take pictures. But anyway, I needed it. I'd done it politically. I needed that book. I just needed it, and it. It sort of broke that pattern. Oh, yeah, it definitely broke that pattern of me just being this skinny photographer that went off to become a dustman. And now they found my shit in a box. And there is no, this guy's a photographer. He's um, one of the only ones, one of the only ones out there to culturally get the raving scene when it started out because no one, I never saw another camera. Ethan, I never saw another, I never saw one ever. So I ended up doing this in, well, on paper, people look at me going, who the fuck is this dude? He's got the skinhead shit, he's got the rave shit, he, he must have been, all I was was looking for a good time. <laughs> yeah. The camera. I wasn't trying to record, you know, big cultural movements. 
<laughs> so I'll go over it, mate, and get into Raid for free. <laughs> Again, it was all through, you know, I've never ever spoke to a publisher, Ethan. I've never knocked on a door. I've never, you know, people go, how do you get a book published? And I feel, sometimes I feel a little bit guilty about the lack of effort I put into it. <laughs> but, you know, then I'll give myself a better time and say, well, I, I did take the pictures. I'm very, very, very fortunate that other people know that they exist because I've made no effort to promote myself. Do you come... I'll get the iron shit because I'm a good talker and I was an actor for 10 years, so, you know, I can do this shit till the sun comes down. Yeah. You know, I'd never contact, you know, you and say, oh, God, could, could you do an interview? I've got a new book coming out. Oh, shit, sorry about the old... I've got this webcam and it's fucking... No, it's all right. I'll just say it's still deliberate. It's like a pain in the arse. It keeps going in and out. It's all right, all right look. Um, so you started working for sound as well, photographing uh, um, and stuff. Yeah, that was my first real professional job. Um, again, you know... It, It was everything else other than me being having a talent. Any excuse. They liked the way I looked. I, I, I was doing. I mean, I was doing forestry for the, on this dole scheme. Um, a place called Chesham. I'll give a haul. They started putting on punk bands in about eighty three. Um, Punk bands, I was too young to go and see. Test you babies, UK subs, Angel Cup starts. Just up the road. So, of course, we're all up there. Bloody brilliant, man. We get a chance to see all our punk heroes. And, of course, I took my camera. And then when they played next, I'll take up, showing the photographs. One of the managers of Peter and Test You Babies said, come down and take some pictures of my band called The Fits that, I'm, um, that I am promoting or managing. Um, test you babies are a big fan of the test you babies went down to King's Cross studio went over to Hyde Park took photographs of the fits they in um, then I was looking through sounds and there's my fucking picture man like that could you go away camera <laughs> anyway so it was so I didn't know anything I, I didn't know how it worked Ethan so I phoned up sounds and I'm like you just published my picture. I want some money. And they're like, because I'm only 18, 19. And they're like, um, doesn't quite work that way, mate. Um, did the band pay you? I went, yeah, yeah, only 50 quid. <laughs> but he said, did the band pay you? I went, yeah. He said, well, it's, you know, that's it. The band, they're the band's photographs and I have them published. But we like your picture. Have you got any more? Can you come down and show us what else you got? Again, I just got my old school folder, which I still got up there with, Barrel loves Lisa on it and that sort of shit. And I didn't really have anything. So I, I got this, I got a meeting with the sounds editor. I went down to uh, Mornington Crescent. I walked in to the office. Let me try and get this down a bit. It's very close up. Fucking piece of shit. Bollocks. Anyway, so I walked in. I'll never get it. It's a big glass office with this huge window behind where the secretary was, and there was a circular seat, and on it were all these fucking students. And I hated students, still do. Um, all these students with their portfolio sat in one room. And I sort of bowled through the doors, like six foot two. Fucking skinhead. I was a skinhead. I was a fucking skinhead. I, was, I wasn't. Dread pretending to be one, it wasn't that so they all look up and like, What the fuck's this? <laughs> <laughs> so I sat by right in the middle, right? Sat there with my fucking school folder. I'll never forget this guy walks out, the head ed editor, and he was like, Very smartly dressed, mod type guy. And he's looking around and he went, Yep. Yeah. Come on, he thought he'd get rid of me first, I suppose. <laughs> What's this fucking nut that's wandered into this? Wandered in, wandered in here, you know. Anyway, so I went in there and I opened my folder and the same thing happened. But, you know, I'm just fucking... He looked at me and went, put him in the folder, go, you're coming with me. Walked out, walked through all these students and they were like, 
walked up to Freddie, I think her name was, and we're like, right, this guy's working for us. So I started working there and then on that, doing front covers at 19. What were you like photographing musicians? Because I know with the skill edge, you were photographing friends and family. Oh, no, it's the same thing, mate. They're all just little gangs. Oh, really? I don't know. Just little gang of blokes, isn't it? Your mates. You started a band with your mates. Well, yeah, yeah. So I love musicians. They're my people. They're the same with tattooists. They're people that have, you know, gained a skill and utilise that skill and, and are putting it out into the world and are rebels at the same time and don't want to be part of the nine to five of, of the system. So I, and I'm, I'm, you know, you've seen me here. I'm very amiable. It's quite strange because I can get pictures like I'm not there, even though I'm very much there. But uh, no, musicians tend to really, really like being photographed by me because I'm, as I said earlier on, I'm fast. And um, again, I've been around music all my life and I'm basically one of them. In, in, instead of having a bass, I've got a camera. Instead of having a, a guitar, I've got a camera. It's all music. It's all been the revolution of mu music that has revolutioned my life, that has sent me on any path has been music based. Um, so yeah, I've always got on well. Never had any problems with any any bands at all ever. And plus, I had the risk with their heads getting kicked in if they pissed me off. So, did anyway. you enjoy your uh, collaborations with fashion brands like Fred Perry? And Love it. Without them, mate. You know, back in the old days, you know, musicians had composers had the prince that looked after what do they call it when they give you money and you can live in their fucking place but they, there's a word for it when artists would be supported by um composers back in the 17 18 1900s they'd be supported by the aristocracy basically now the fashion industry is my because i i've had no love from the establishment I know I exist. No invites to the National Portrait Gallery. No um, articles in any of the mainstream. A few in the mainstream press, but nothing in the photography world. You know, it's just that it feels like they've tried to ignore the fact is that I went, I've done everything opposite to what you're meant to be doing to get to where you need to go. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being paranoid, but. Uh, yeah, so without the fashion and music industry, mate, we wouldn't. Um, most people wouldn't know my stuff existed. I mean, we well, are. Yeah, I've slagged fashion or fucking fashion, vacuous crap. It's fucking tomorrow's recycling. Who gives a fuck about fashion? I was just jealous. You'd look open Vogue, and there'd be these incredible pictures every week. You're like, oh, yeah. it's the same with the guys that could paint, like you know, could draw those perfect pictures down in Leicester Square. Same with the Vogue photographers. You're like, I'm so far at the bottom of the pile. I'm never going to get any work. I'll never get anything. But then, you know, Doc Martin came, this magazine came along and said, do you fancy doing some fashion stuff? I spent all those years slagging it off. <laughs> You're right. What a wanker. And then I found out I was really good at it. And then I found out that I'd always been a fashion photographer. Well, yeah, yeah. Let's and I, I, I got to enjoy it. I'm, I'm very fortunate, Ethan. I attract the right people like Farah, Dr. Martins, Fred Perry. So it all works well with my energy. I'm not out there seven days a week photographing shite I'm not interested in. And I get a lot of respect. I've had um, a clothing run with Doc Martin. I've had a clothing run with Farah. I've now got one with Umbro at the moment. Um, so, yeah, the fashion... And what's beautiful is I'll put my signature on it, which is which is unheard of, you know. It's the exhibition in Milan through one, bro. Um, yes, Slam Jam, which are like a mark their own brand, but they're also very much a, a a big marketing brand that like they they'll do collaborations with Clarks. They'll bring Alpha and Umbro together, um, and I've also had some very successful. A couple of very successful shows in in Italy, and I'm very well received out there. And that's what happened there. A friend of mine who's in connection with these guys mentioned that he was in contact with me. They're like we're big fans. 
let's do a couple of we work with umber at the moment why don't we do a couple of t-shirts there's three of them and get gavin over and we'll do a show and it was fucking unbelievable you pulled a big crowd of self photos on your social media or that it was more like a gig bruv really thank god because i buried my brother the day before oh sorry to hear that so it's all very bizarre but they had uh, hundreds of posters to sign and i just thank god for that because i just would know would not have known what to do with myself i had something to do something to focus on you know signing the signing the prints and i signed 300 and there were people queuing outside the door so it's all real blur but it, yeah i mean you know and then i'll come back here and sit and ask him until something else happens <laughs> but yeah that was good that, that was good how does it make you feel though with like hundreds of people in my land credit seeds does that like make you proud of what, <clears throat> of what you've done I, I, I don't know how one owns that. I don't know if one should own that. I don't know what, you know, you don't, photographers don't take photographs of themselves and artists don't make art for them. They make, they make it for the people out there. And it's just a great reflection of, you know, it's travel to a highly respected town. You know, these people aren't, they're, 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 they're sophisticated in Milan in the fashion world. And for have a crowd like that turn up and have people queuing up to, you know, these are all people within the industry as well. It wasn't just, and they're young, all young as well. So it's a great privilege, but I have to digest that shit and I don't own it because I, what the fuck am I meant to do with that? You know, I just got to get back here, put my tracksuit bottoms on and get on GTA 5. <laughs> um, yeah, I've never really known what to do. I do own it a little bit more than I did. It was all an accident or, you know, it, it, it was an accident this happened and it was an accident that happened. It's only been since I've, you know, being about 54, that I've actually thought, well, actually, your photographs ain't bad. <laughs> People like him for a reason. But I, I'm i happy with that because I, you know, what's one meant to do? We'll go around pumping their chest, go, look what I did, because I don't believe I'm 100% totally responsible for it. It's a fucking bunce, mate. It's just all a bunce, really. It's all against all odds on paper. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. So what have you have you got anything planned for the future you can talk about? I'm just about and anybody that played GTA five will know fucking will know about this, mate. I ne- just got 140 million this morning. I ground 140 million. It costs a tenner to buy a hundred and uh, one point five million. So I'm proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> um but other than that, in the real world, hopefully, um, I'm going to be doing more work with uh, Slam Jam, and we're going to be doing, hopefully, you know, but there's so much is spoken about and never happens, but there was a discussion of maybe doing a, a small Gavin Watson brand based on my imagery. So like the kid on the BMX bike, you'd create a... a, uh, a a fashion ensemble out of that a jacket jeans based on the pictures six pictures six of my famous pictures and sort of uh clothes that go with that but that's all up in the air at the moment something will happen i'm, I'm at that stage now my work you know there's always a request here or yeah request for a print there or a tv program using it but as again i, I don't really know i don't have any goals really which is a pain. Um, I just sort of go with the flow. So I'm all running along behind it in a lot of ways. I'm still alive to be able to, you know, do it, but it's bigger than me now. I mean, I drop dead right now in front of you and it's still fucking March on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I just hope my kids and my grandkids don't sell it off and buy drugs with it. And <laughs> I'm on. But at least, you know, I've got the whole things there that I've, you know, there's very few people that actually leave a legacy and I've actually got one. Um, I want to appreciate it more. I don't undersell myself as much as I used to. Still do. Yeah, um, yeah as I said, you know, I'm, as I said, I've done that job and I thought my legs are fucking aching now. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to run around doing it, um, but I'll be here as long as I as long as there's interest yeah well it's 
like you say, uh, people are all over the world are still interested. So who knows how long? Do you know what I mean? Well, uh, it's but it's history, isn't it? It's not just fashion. It's a historical document of that time with the working class, which is quite rare in itself, really. It's a study of people from 10 to 20. It's a study of, yeah, it's a study of the same people growing up over over a 10-year period and going into the rave. So there's a lot to it. And there's a lot of, um, I'd like to do more in education, I think. I'd like to go around and talk about it more. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I'd also I had this idea about, which what we've done in Italy with the big gallery they had there, they had space in between. There's always space between the next show. Now I want to go around to all these galleries and say, right, we'll go in there for that week. It will be mobbed and you'll get a load of attention and then I'll be gone on to the next one for a week. So it's just an idea, but sort of like doing pop up exhibitions in the space between because a lot of these fucking places are booked out for years, but they've got rooms here that are never used. and. Because I really, and I want to spend more time in Italy. I vibe with the place. I love it out there. Yeah. Well, do you go there often then for the exhibition? Or was that the first one? No, no, no. I had, I had a Vice one that was just as just as mental as that one 10 years ago. And they still talk about it now. Hey, man, I was at the Vice exhibition. Huh? <laughs> and um, oh, also Scandinavia. I've had a lot of interest out in Scandinavia. Still a few countries I need to get to. I know that you know I've got a big fan base out in Japan. I think um, I'd like to get out there at some point. Um, none of this is really that solid. I'll just see what happens. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've enjoyed chatting to you. Do you want to talk about some of the photos, or do I just leave it there? It's up to you. Let me do one. Pick one. Uh, let me have a look which one I've got. I, I sent you some dinner. Yeah, we got Skinny Jim. Got the girl. Which is your favourite? Uh, my, my favourite oh, yeah. is probably the one of your brother in front of the Union Jack flag. Oh, where's that then? Did I send that one? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, literally, we just had this. We nicked at the royal wedding, we nicked loads of flags. And we still had a few hanging around. And that was a few years later. And um, sometimes I'd look in the drawer and they'd be back in the old days when you when you sent pictures off, they'd send you a shit film. You know, well, a company that wasn't Kodak or one of the big companies, they'd send you a film. And I just think that day, just hanging about and bored, and I just took those pictures literally for no reason whatsoever, except we were just hanging out and my brother was hanging out with his mates and I said, oh, let's take some pictures. So there was nothing, you know, there was no reason for it except a, bo a boring Sunday afternoon. And that's funny how these photographs become, you know, quite iconic when there's no real reason for it except, you know, being posers and, and fucking about. What about that Skinny Jim one? What, is there oh, Skinny Jim, that? That, that, I used that. I've been using that photograph as a, a flagship picture because I needed a picture to focus on when people done interviews. I wanted one out there that if you looked at it and you're interested in this world, to go, oh, that's a Gavin Watson. So went down to London when we were 15. Skinny Jim came from Beaconsfield. He was a fucking arrogant little bastard. As only a fit. Oh my God. He just, he was brilliant. He just was so like fucking, <laughs> and I only only hung out with him like twice, I think, and then he disappeared off the face of the earth. You know, like when we were young, we meet somebody for a couple of days or a week, hang about, and gone. That that's what happens. If if I wasn't a photographer, I wouldn't probably remember he existed. Yeah, you know what I mean. But anyway, so on the train, we've gone down. It's a rainy day. We're wandering to Carnby Street, go to Piccadilly Circus, and be on the train. And I don't know, I just took that picture when you could still smoke on there. Didn't think much of it. And then, but now I look at it and I think there's so many levels to it. It's just such a brilliant, strong image. Blows my mind. I was 15. I'll put that up against any of the great photographers in the world. That. Yeah, it's a brilliant photo. That. You know, and yeah. 
and what makes it even more mental is I was 15. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying, like, without learning. It's like self-taught. You can do your own thing, can't you, instead of playing by the rules kind of thing. Yeah, well, and it's unconscious. It's, I'm just want to take pictures, and I'm, you know, it was frustrating enough trying to do my artwork. And, yeah. Um, and again, I didn't think anyone was ever going to see it, let alone it being, you know, that, that strong an image that represents so much in a way, smoking on the tube, the, you know, West Ham scarf, square jaw that doesn't even look real. You know what I mean? And the shape in the background, the way it goes off and that sort of guy in the tweed jacket, it's just, I think it's a beautiful image. Um, there's really what I really like. Any of my stuff, you know? There's another, so photo, there's another photo I sent you that I really like. Uh, is it Freedom of Dance in London? Yeah, yeah, pissing down in rain. And I was like, oh, I better go up and uh, better go up and fucking take some pictures, I suppose. So I went right, climbed through the crowd, stood up there, photographed the whole crowd. And uh, yeah, it was an important day, you know. But the kids came there, you know, it was organic. It was organic. And things changed pretty quick after that. It's like, no, these kids are serious. They want to go out after half past 10. You're going to have to change the law. And it was so packed. Mob, all these ravers. I mean, ravers getting up and making political fucking waves. That was amazing. I'm really glad I went. I'm really glad I got that picture as well. But I do remember it was fucking pissing down. And then there was this like upper middle class guy that was a big part of it called Tony Coulter something. He get going, you got to fucking party, everybody. Fucking and they had to try to grab the mic off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so many people that have gone, I'm in there somewhere. Now it's a beauty of photography, really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah exactly. Well, there's quite a few photographs from that day, but uh, I managed to get it with that girl stood on that guy's head. By the looks of it, um, yeah, it's just one of those things where where we went because we obviously, you know, it was for the ravers, and we were ravers. And I just bought my camera for the sake of like, oh, I might as well take some pictures while I'm there. And I think I only took about six. I've never been one to do take loads and loads of pictures. I do now because of digital, but back then I'd just take one or two. What sort of film would last? Yeah. Oh, because I wasn't, you know, I couldn't afford film. In fact, there's millions of photographs I could have taken if I wasn't such a tight fuck. So I shall get a film, I shall buy a beer. Oh, get a beer, fuck it. So a lot of those photographs, like with Skinny Jim, that's not like I wasn't taking 40 of that picture. That's just one off. That's one picture. Yeah. That's more impressive than you captured it with just one, isn't it? Yeah. So. What about the one with the three uh, lads wearing bowler hats that, with a policeman? It looks like sort of like a madness video to it. Yeah, the Brian, um, he was very much involved in the punk underground uh, clothing scene. But he had a thing called Artificial Eye that was really dark, really fucking dark, Mara Hindley dark shit, you know. Uh, just yeah. Anyway, he was doing all this stuff, all this really dark fucking Alistair Crowley t-shirts and then he'd done a load of acid one night and a bit like Pink Floyd the Wall he just started cleaning everything up and then he had the idea to start a clock or, clock or orange stall and we heard about it went down there and sort of became friends we never became friends with him and um, I took photographs of the clothes that he was selling in the shop and I was out there because it was Kensington we were going to do some by the statues and this old copper pulled up in his fucking top end bike and started talking to us and I just had my camera I just went click but yeah I was just photographing you know for his pictures with the clothes that he was selling ah uh, really yeah but we all dressed like clockwork for about six months and it was quite good we had a little London gang where we'd all go out with bowler hats on and stuff so uh, and I got some really good photographs out of it Brian was a really dynamic guy, really, really dynamic guy. And uh, again, there's a, a phase went through to a little bit just before raving, about 86, 87, we'd spend a lot of time, well, I was living in London anyway, I'd spend time working in the shop and uh, he had a factory that I built, uh, my dad bought, built a little darkroom in 
And yeah, it was a good time. It was an interesting time. Again, connected to fashion. Um, Brian being connected to fashion. Mm. Can you see the photo on your screen with the uh, two white lads and the black lads stood in the middle? Yeah. Is there a story behind that one? Of course there is. Yeah, Tyrus was my best, my little brother's best mate. And they both got into madness together when they were about nine, ten, nine. Um, the two other kids were in my year at school. And Tyrus, his mum, shipped him off to LA, man. <laughs> nice. And he ended up getting involved in gang shit and all that. But anyway, they... So he went out to America with all this madness in his head. And then he came back for a brief holiday and came around to see Nev. So you've got this L.A. black kid dressed like an L.A. black kid with a, a members only jacket, the fucking run DMC hat. Do you know what I mean? And then you've got two of my mates that are just hanging around my house for the day um, that evening after school. And I just took that picture. So there, but it's mental because he literally got off the plane from L.A. the day before. That's quite a rare sort of image, really. I don't think you'd get many, many of those around, especially um, with the uh, members only jacket. Have you got a favourite though from over the years? Or is no, it a big one? They change. The yeah, reason yeah, I love Skinny Jim is because of the excellence of the actual image, but uh, no, no. Probably be something weird as well. The thing is, though, it's different for you because you've got a story behind it, like from that day and stuff like that. Whereas people who look at them, they see a different kind of story. That's the most important thing. That's what I don't like um, putting too much description, man. And another thing I don't fucking like is, hey, man, I've got a really great idea. Hey, yeah, what's that, eh? Oh, why don't you go and photograph all the skinheads now? So, well, one half they're dead, and I don't want to see Peter Pan as some fat old fuck. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, who wants to see young and beautiful people go, yeah, his mate, you are, his fucking diabetes tablets and his fucking, <laughs> you know, I've got no teeth left. Do you know what I mean? Who wants to see that shit? Neville's still really fit. I mean, Neville's fucking machine. He works in Muzzle Hill as a personal trainer in a gym at the moment when he's not making his music. But yeah, but most of them, most of us are fucked, man. Do you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I don't, that's the idea I've always like, really? If that's the only idea, what I would do is I'd photograph the kids and the grandkids. That's what I'd photograph. Yeah. Yeah, but not us fucking wrinkly old motherfuckers. Who wants to see that? Um, <laughs> and I really enjoyed photographing the grandkids. Which is the same as what I've always done. I've, ne I've always done what I've done. My family and the people I love. And they, even the grandkids are fucking model photogenic. I don't know if you looked at my Instagram. You see the girl on the um, playing PlayStation? I said... Yeah, the other day. Yeah, marked to a presser on it. Yeah, I think I did see that one, yeah. Yeah, that's my granddaughter. She looks like a fucking movie star. And my grandson has got similar thing that what Neville's got. So I'm just fortunate like that. And if I'm interested and I've got love for something, then the photographs tend to be better. And that's what I try and do when I've done my fashion work and when I do my band work. I try and get as become friends with the person as quickly as possible. So I'm, I've got that element of that I'm photographing one of my friends and it really helps. And most people are decent, man. Yeah. I've never really met too many arseholes in my life. Plan B could be a bit fucking intense. But other than that, he was always good to me. Did you work on a film with him? <laughs> I'm in it. Yeah, in the film, yeah, yeah. Ill manners when a geezer gets done for cocaine. I'm going the fucking bleh. anyway. Yeah, I worked on that film. I've done the movie poster for it. Photographed the movie poster. Done Plan B's uh, Ill Manners album cover and the booklet. Done all that. Right, the last story, which is a good one to end on. Do you want it? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, being an actor, <clears throat> darling. Have being an actor, the reason I was an actor is I love films and I love movies and I love I love it. Yeah, it's one of my big things. Not anymore because they're all shit. But 
you know, the reason I got into acting was, you know, De Niro and all the all my all my heroes. But anyway, and then I gave up. I'll tell you that story another time of why I gave up acting. But anyway, so I'm watching movies, I'm watching movies, and I look out for the hard men because it's very, very difficult. Some people think it's about muscles, it's not about muscles. It's hard to see anyone on screen that makes you that makes me nervous. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh my god, that guy's fucking more. Anyway, so I'm watching this movie called Harry Brown. And this there's this fucking cunt, and I thought that ain't an actor, man. That is some <laughs> guy they've got off a fucking borstal. And they've got him, he's done some acting course inside, and they've got him in. For the first time ever, I was made a bit nervous, not nervous, yeah, nerd, like, a bit like, whoa, that guy looks like he could actually stab some old man in the back, right? I didn't think much more of it, right? But I remember he, he had an effect on me. I thought, that's a real fucking deal with that cunt. That's, that's, that's what I see outside now. What he reminded me of was like, some of my most violent friends And the sort of violence that wasn't like angry violence, just like, you know, <laughs> no second thought, you know. I'm not saying they were unintelligent because they were, but they just seemed to have this sort of <sighs> fucking violence. Anyway, it was like he was one of their kids where at least those guys had a little bit of moral and moral fibre, but by the time the kids came along, they just had none. Anyway, so I'm there watching my fucking cat videos or whatever videos conspiracy shit on youtube next minute there's this dude singing like a girl the same bloke singing not like a girl but you know singing and doing it brilliantly i'm not i just it shocked me so much i couldn't believe it was the same dude i couldn't believe this guy that i thought was a stupid murderer was this incredible musician and it's incredible so i became like a hooked teenage fan girl right so I was, you know, watching everything he'd done. And I'm like, you know, fucking, yeah. I'm like, this guy's incredible. Not only is he a brilliant actor, he's fucking brilliant. This stuff's brilliant. Strickland Banks and all that. Anyway, so <laughs> I'm on the tube, right? And it's packed, fucking mob. And there's the old Metro, you know, the Metro newspaper. It's free behind me. So I'm looking through it and it's got the 60 second interview. Plan B. And I'm, oh, Plan B, I like him. Oh, I'll read that. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Got to the bottom, I still remember. He goes, so Ben, what are you doing for Christmas? Anything planned? He goes, no, I don't like Christmas very much. It always ends up in an argument. But last year, my girlfriend bought me a print by Gavin Watson. He's a photographer. I really like him. Jesus. And I'm like, Fuck, that's all I need, another Gavin Watson out of here. <laughs> that's exactly what I thought. Until halfway through that thought, I thought, oh shit, I think that's me. <laughs> I'm not a sycophant because I've been around, you know, I've been around this shit for years. I've been acting for years. I've been around musicians for years. But that, there was something about that being so random. And me having so, you know, over the last few months, totally and utterly becoming obsessed with this artist and for me to read that anyway i phoned him out of my head scrying um he's an actor now he was in ben's movie he was in um he's just been in rebel moon he was in ill manners B big guy with a skinhead he was in oh. game of thrones anyway i phoned ed up because i knew that he knew ben but yeah man he's a fucking big fan man so come and meet him so I went down to meet him. He went, come and work for me. I went, yeah, right. <laughs> so <laughs> for two years, I went on tour. I'd done his album covers, done all his press shots. And, you know, I was out there being a part of that whole experience, which was, which was great, man. It was good to catch up with what the youngsters were like now. Yeah. So there you go. The Plan B story. Well, thank you for that interview. I've really enjoyed it, Gavi Lou. It's been really interesting. I wasn't ranting on too much. I can go on, mate. You know, like, I prefer that than people that don't answer properly and stuff. So I really do. I really did enjoy that. Tony's each, each, 
you know, to get to that story, it really is quite way back. You've got to go for it. So none of it's <laughs> just like a simple story. But no, I enjoyed that. Ethan. And you know what? It does help me understand the, the process a little bit more or understand my thoughts to, to, to the work a little bit more because, you know, I've got the work and then I've got my, I'm sort of like above it all the time. Not above it, but I find it difficult to own it. Yeah. And, um, you know, sometimes talking about it, something always a little bit different comes up. Some little element will always come up that I hadn't thought about before. So, and I'm not going to be doing two more, two more of a mate because I do bore myself. It's thinking you though, know, like um, it's interesting to know, the, like how you feel about it and what was going through your mind when you were doing it and stuff like that. That's what I enjoy about doing these interviews. Well, what was mental about it was it wasn't even part of my mind space that anyone would ever take that that would have ever been you know it was like i'd about to be a wedding photographer if, the, if that's what i had to do yeah you know the, the skinhead thing came came in i was 28 it was like ancient history by then in my life you know, still you know you never once a skinhead you're always a skinhead you know what i mean but i was 28 and you know it was a long time ago and then it will it will build up again and now i'm mr fucking skinhead um but yeah the the journey has been very interesting and uh, i think that's quite good to share that for other creatives i think the most important thing to do if you feel in your heart you do there is something special which just haven't hasn't manifested the direction and it's always left field just keep creating content yeah you know and hopefully that content will get out to the mass it will get out to the eyes and it's going to be the people that reject it it's not up to you to judge it it's just up to you to get it out there the best you can and then if the great unwashed don't like it then go and get a job as a security guard if the great unwashed like it then you're going to do well but it's not up to us creators it's not up to us. we're not creating for us we're doing it for other people i'm quite a strong believer in that otherwise why do it or you do it for yourself do you, you understand what i mean yeah not... yeah like once you've done it it's out there to the world it's there yeah, yeah. so if you're gonna make music get ears on it don't sit in your bedroom going, I'm better than that one. How come I'm not famous? Just keep creating content. All right, Ethan, my good man, I shall hopefully, well, um, when's it going to go up? I mean, are you going to... I'm going to try and get on tonight, yeah. All right, brother. All right, then. Cheers. See you later, mate. Nice, we'll see you.